Hello. Welcome to How to Recognize and Design Five Star Training. I'm Andre Chatlin, Product Manager for Rapid Intake. I have a master's degree in instructional design and educational psychology from the University of Utah. I've been working as an instructional designer for over seven years. So first off, I want to make sure that everyone can hear me. Um, if you have issues with the audio, go ahead and type that in your chat. Um, so I've given you my short bio. I want to get a feel of who you are uh, with a couple short poll questions. Uh, so if you can go ahead and respond to these. How many years of experience do you have creating learning? Okay, looks like most people have responded. Looks like the bulk of us have had 12 plus, or 8 to 12, 4 to 8. Good. Okay, next question. What is the size of your development team? Okay, looks like most have finished. Let's take a look at the results. Uh, looks like two to five has the highest and good portion are the one-man bands. Good. Okay, how many courses do you create on average each year? Okay, I'm going to close the poll. Okay, that gives us a good feel of how much of your time is spent in developing training. Good. Uh, one more question. Where is your organization at in regards to deploying learning to mobile devices, to iPads, iPhones, tablets? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close this poll as well. Um, and it seems to follow suit. Um, it looks like most people are planning to do it, um, but not anytime soon. Um, each of the different webinars that we do, it, it's interesting to see the various responses depending on the type of webinar that we're doing. Good, excellent. Um, let's go ahead and talk about what we're going to um, be discussing in this webinar. We're going to be covering the why and how of effective training and using Dr. Merrill's five-star rating criteria to evaluate some training to see if it's relevant and solves work-related problems, validates learners' existing knowledge and skills, uses real-world examples and demonstrations, and gives the learner opportunity to practice and then integrate their knowledge. And we'll look at how you can use the five-star rating in your own design system. Okay, as we go, please feel free to submit any questions that you have in the chat. So, how, why do we need effective training to improve efficiency, safety, skills, and of course the bottom line? Now, I don't know for sure, but I'm guessing the people in these pictures might have received their physics training by some type of zero-star training, like PowerPoint poison or spraying prayer lectures or even sink and swim self-taught training. So this webinar is going to assume that you've moved beyond this type of training and are already engaging your learners. But how many stars does your training deserve? A great way to improve your trainings is to evaluate it using Dr. Da David Merrill's first principles of instructional reading system. So I'm going to do another quick uh, poll just to find out if you 
um, have heard of or have used or read Dr. Merrill's research on first principles of instruction or five-star instructional design rating. Okay, I'm going to close the poll. Looks like most of you haven't. Um, so this will be a good training um, for you to be able to see some of this instruction. Great place for you to go is to the University um, Utah, uh, University of Southern Utah, excuse me, um, website, and you can get a lot of his research and the paper, papers that he's published there. I like to, Dr. Merrill's instructional design work because it's easy to read and easy to apply. And this rating system he designed is for evaluating tutorial and simulation types of training. And it's not uh, good for lectures or exploratory training. Okay, now let's look at how to qualify for the first star. Does the training focus on real-world problems? What I've learned is that showing learners the task or problem they will be able to solve is more effective than stating the abstract learning objectives. It's contrary to the schooling that I got because they always tell you to show the learners the list of objectives. But to this point, I don't think I remember any learners that have actually read that slide. So what I've done is I've selected a sample course that we're going to use um, that's been developed using Rapid Intake's authoring tool so that we can evaluate something as we go along. So for this first star, I understand that uh, video doesn't work really well uh, through the webinar, but it'll probably be a lot more exciting than watching my PowerPoint text. So as I'm going through this first slide, go ahead and listen to it, and we'll ask the questions uh, to see if it qualifies for the first star. Our lives are full of hazards. You never know when something unexpected is going to happen. One minute you're doing your job. The next minute you're precariously hanging by your pants because you got hit by something you didn't see coming. In driving, it's often the hazards we don't expect or recognize in time that cause us to crash. Fortunately, we can almost always identify and avoid hazards when we're paying attention and know where to look. You're about to jump into a lesson on recognizing driving hazards. And if you're like me, you might be surprised at what you see or don't see. All right. So the purpose of this fleet driver course is to help fleet drivers learn how to avoid the most common types of crashes. Um, so does it apply to real live or real work questions? Um, is it applicable to the first star? Uh, some of the other things that he asks in the first uh, star is, do the learners get to see how to solve the problems? Are the students engaged at the task or problem level? Is there a progression of problems? So, let's take a look at the second star. As we watch the next page of the training, you decide if it meets the requirement for the second star. Um, and I'll ask you the questions along the way. As it starts, it's going to give instructions to the user on how to do it. Um, they're supposed to identify the obvious hazards as they're driving along. I'll see if I can do this and ask the questions at the same time. So in the training, does the training direct the learners to recall, to relate, to describe or apply knowledge from relevant past experience that can be used uh, as a foundation for new knowledge. So in each of your courses, you want to make sure that it's going to be starting off with a pretest of some sort so they can show off the skills that they have already. Uh, does the training then validate what the learner already knows about the subject? Uh, does it give them feedback? Uh, does it give them the opportunity to de demonstrate the skills that they have, not only asking them the skills? So I'm going to let the feedback play so that you can kind of get a, um, an idea of how this validates uh, the learners in this type of training. So 
So the green circles here show what the learner did click. The red circles show what the learner didn't click. Nice work. Looks like you're familiar with many driving hazards, especially those crossing your line of sight. Your ability to detect these hazards is crucial for good driving. You might have also noticed that this scenario contains other hazards, more subtle, hidden ones. These hidden hazards are the ones killing drivers, especially less experienced drivers. This lesson in hazard recognition will help to add an awareness of hidden hazards to your understanding of visible ones, helping you avoid unnecessary risks. Good. So what do you think? In my estimation, this example deserves a star because the learner is able to demonstrate that they can identify the obvious hazards, and they're shown the latent or hidden hazards that they missed. Uh, it also provides opportunity for the learners to see what's expected of them by the end of the course. Uh, it is interesting with this course they did, uh, they did bring this same exercise back up in another lesson, attention and distraction, where they have them go through and start texting while they're trying to do the same thing. So it brings it to a, a more complex level. Okay, any questions or comments to this point? You can go ahead and type those in the chat area. Okay, so let's move on to the third star. Um, what I want you to do is watch the masks and the mask definition and the examples page here. Uh, while I read the questions of how to qualify for this next star, the third star. So one thing that's important with your training is to make sure that the examples are consistent with the object objectives. When you're teaching concepts, you want to make sure that you're using examples and non-examples. And when you're teaching procedures, you want to make sure that you're using demonstrations. Okay. When teaching processes, you use visualizations. And then when you're teaching behaviors, the training should use modeling. So let me let this play for a second so you can kind of get a feel of what it's doing. Low light conditions at night or twilight can also be a mask since they can obscure your vision. Even a deep shadow from an overpass can hide ice, debris, or other hazards from an approaching driver. Sometimes masks are built right into the landscape. Here, the shape of this road, a sharp curve, hides whatever's around the bend. So what I liked about this training was that it first started with a definition of masks that relate to every user. It shows the hockey mask, the surgeon's mask, and then helps transition them from those types of masks to using the concept in the driving world where masks become anything that hides information that they need to know uh, while they're driving. Um, and also at the very end of this, we'll show them um, one of the first slides that they saw. Um, I guess it's right here. Let me show it. No, it's play. What, what about the truck in the distance? Or those trees? Are those masks too? These things do hide hazards from our view, but because they're still a ways away, we don't have to direct our attention to them right now. Just keep them in mind. We need to focus our attention on the masks that could be hiding something that poses an immediate threat. Our okay, so one thing that's nice about this is that it not only shows examples, but also the non-examples. So non-examples uh, mean that in this instance, the truck, the dump truck that you see way up there, it is a large vehicle in the tree, and they will mask information they need to know, but they, it's not masking stuff that they need to know right now. So it's good to show that contrast so that they understand the concept from both uh, perspectives. Okay, so the fourth star reminds me of my mom when she was trying to teach me how to play the piano because she would always say this over and over, practice, practice, practice. Well, that's what we want the learners to do. Um, are, is the practice that they're receiving in the post-test and the pre-test consistent with the objectives? Are the learners required to use the new knowledge or skill to solve the varied sequence of problems? Um, and then the coaching, is it something that's gradually removed so that the learner isn't um, relying on the uh, software training program 
to teach them and be there to give them the answers at every step. Um, let's take a look at this course again. In the first few pages, it gives examples of the concepts that are being taught, um, and then it gives the first practice exercise. Um, the practice exercise has a lot less uh, complexity, complexity in it compared to the pretest. And so here they just learned about mass. There's, as they're driving along down this road, there's only one mass that they have to identify, and then it's going to give them feedback. So we'll play this out. So possibly the tree, maybe the sign over there, or that vehicle over there. And then it gives them feedback in real time. You've got a mask here that you need to be aware of. This butt is hiding everything on your right side. Whenever you come upon a parked vehicle, especially a big one like this, you've got to plan on hidden hazards. Now, here's how things might have looked if you'd spotted the mask a little earlier. In a similar situation, early in the morning in October... So this course does a good job of allowing them to demonstrate the skill that they've just learned, this new concept of mask. It also gives them coaching, a lot of hand-holding, where it tells them, well, if you had done it right, this is what it would have looked like, the consequence. Um, and then it also gives them a real-life experience where somebody that didn't um, see the mask or recognize it in time uh, and the uh, results that happened because of it. So as you go along this course, they have a lot of different uh, concepts and then examples. And then you can see here there's practice, practice, and then they start to combine the practices or they become a lot more complex. They'll show uh, scorecards um, along the way. Uh, and then it ends at, with the challenge where they're given several scenarios back to back, but the coach doesn't come in uh, to give them feedback. They just have short scenario scorecards. And then the final scorecard at the end looks something like this, where they're shown what their first attempt was. And then they can go back and try it again uh, with different hints and things along the way. So this course does a really good job with this. Um, where they don't do very well is with the uh, fifth star. So let's take a look at that. So we'll start with an analogy. I love this picture. Did you hear about the penguin that learned how to fly at school, then walked home? Wait for it. Wait for it. Uh, the fifth star is all about transferring your knowledge. This is your training. Uh, deserve the fifth star if it provides techniques for the transferring of the new knowledge into the real world context. So in the fleet driver training, uh, they did give a lot of uh, real life scenarios in a simulated world and they encouraged the user to apply their new concepts on the road. But Dr. Merrill suggests that the five star training does a lot more than that. It should provide opportunity for the learner, learners to publicly demonstrate their knowledge and somehow assess that then provide opportunity for learners to reflect on or discuss, and then defend their new knowledge or skill, and provide opportunity for learners to create, invent, or explore new and personal ways to use their new knowledge or skill. So there's an ownership that takes place for the learners that needs to happen. So here's where I'd like your input. So take advantage of the chat function on the webinar tool. Uh, if you've had success in applying these fifth principles, fifth star principles of design, please share what your experience is in the webinar chat. So I'll just give you a moment to do that, um, and then we'll apply uh, what we've learned today um, in your own design training. Okay. Uh, feel free to keep adding uh, questions and comments. Um, we'll take a look at those at the end. So an attempt to qualify for the fifth star, let's transfer what you've learned already in the webinar into your own system of design. So here's the typical structure of a training development team. And as you know, it gets pretty complex, especially as you get um, a, a lot larger organization. And it becomes very difficult to manage. So my first uh, suggestion is to make sure that your five-star expectations are known to everyone that's working um, on the project so that you're all on the same page. Uh, using a collaborative tool like uh, Rapid Intake, it's a collaborative authoring tool that's uh, in the cloud. 
and it allows everyone to literally work on the same page because they're working from the same tool and can do it at the same time. So second, um, let me pull up what the rapid intake authoring tool looks like. Um, this is a great tool for storyboarding. The second suggestion I have is to add the fifth star criteria to your storyboard template. So what's nice about this tool is you can add topics and pages uh, pretty quickly um, and then it gives you forms on how to fill them out. So my suggestion is go ahead and put in these placeholders so that your uh, instructional designers or your writers have something to work on, um, kind of a framework that they can use as they develop the training. So they'll make sure that they include a purpose that has the problems that need to be solved already in the training. So this is different from listing your objectives and hoping the learners can uh, glean something from that abstract concept. Then make sure that as a pretest, allow the users to show off the skills that they already have, the knowledge they already have, uh, so that it will help validate um, that they have experience in this area. And then you can tell them or direct them to what they're going to be learning later on. Next, um, make sure that your presentations and examples are consistent with your objectives um, and make sure that they can practice throughout the training. So presentation, practice, presentation, practice, simulation, practice. Um, and then include some type of assessment where you can uh, pass scores and results um, to your LMS with SCORM compliant um, APIs. Um, and then the last piece is make sure there's some way that you can help them to transfer that knowledge. So as we talked about before, give them the opportunity to create or invent or share their ideas so that they, they can take ownership of the training. Uh, good ways to do that are with essays, um, with comparisons, with case studies or surveys, or it may be just another assignment. So perhaps with this uh, driver training that we just went through, they would actually have to go out in the next day and apply the hazard recognition skills that they've learned and come back the next day and report on it. What are the latent or hidden hazards that you found in your driving that you hadn't noticed before? Um, how did this training uh, help you to become more aware in your driver, in your driving? So those are some different ways in being able to help them to transfer their skills and knowledge. A lot of them are self-assessed, um, but that's okay if you can get them into that mode of uh, thinking about that. Uh, they'll better be able to apply it in their lives. So, okay, let's show you one other thing. Uh, another great way is to make sure that when you are uh, doing the review of your training course that uh, you allow the people that are doing the review to know what the five-star criteria is. Train them in it before they go and do the, your training. That way you'll get more than just uh, comments on spelling or colors. Uh, you'll get things that will actually enhance your training and make it better. So again, um, Rapid Intake's reviewing tool is pretty neat uh, because it allows anybody um, to be able to view the course as the learners would view it uh, and then be able to add issues uh, just by clicking a button. So here, um, this is the second page of the course. Uh, this would be a great place uh, for them to include um, something that uh, is like a pretest. So I'm going to give an issue, replace this cloud video. I'll describe my issue here. Um, and then I can identify what the priority is for it and then assign it um, to a category. So this is where you could put in your five-star um, principles. So this one relates to the objectives and then I would just click add an issue um, and then th in real time the developers can actually be working on this uh, training uh, as the issues are applying. And So if you have multiple users going through it uh, they're not all finding the exact same issues because your developers can be fixing those issues as you go along. So it's a great tool to be able to take advantage of. Um, and now um, we're at a point where I would like to go through your questions. What are some of the different things that have come to your mind as we've talked about the five-star training? Um, what are ways that you've thought of that will help you to be able to apply this training?
Okay, so I'll just start going through a couple of these. Um, looks like the first question is, yes, we'll provide a copy of this so that you can go through it. Um, let's see. Uh, in the very first pretest, uh, was there a demonstration explaining them how they should go through and answer the questions? Yep, in that course sample that we did, um, that was the first thing. We kind of skipped it so that uh, I didn't take up all your time. But yeah, that was. Uh, this course does a good job of explaining what the learner needs to do, and then allows them to jump right in and do it. Uh, so it isn't a lot of lecture, it's uh, show and then practice, show and then practice. So that's a good question, that's something we need to uh, pay attention to in our training. Um, took me a few instances to know you were clicking on something to give a correct answer. Yep, uh, in with the simulation and with the webinar, um, it's, you've got a little bit of delay whenever you're looking at video. Uh, but they did a great job with the simulations uh, because they were tracking the user's clicks as they were going through. So in real time, as the user clicked, not only what they clicked on, but when they clicked on the object uh, was being assessed. Good points uh, on being able to critique the training. Um, I'm good at technical training, but I'm having difficulty transferring to soft skill training presentations. Um, I'd, I'm in the same boat. <laughs> soft skill training is very difficult. Uh, a lot of it uh, should be scenario-based. Um, Dr. Merrill talks about uh, when you're trying to change behaviors, that one of the best ways to do that is through modeling. Um, so if you have a case study, uh, if you have a choose-your-own-adventure, uh, those are great ways to practice and assess. Uh, but the most important thing is that you model the good behavior that you want done. And if you can, create a simulation where the user is able to do that themselves. Okay. Um, have you set up a compliance training for completing strategy and concept documents? I personally haven't. Um, if there's somebody out there that would like to chat that, um, you're welcome to add that in there. Um, Uh, one of the suggestions on being able to transfer the training is to give them homework assignments um, that then is assessed, I assume, by the teacher. Um, and that's, that's a great way. Uh, one of the difficult parts is to be able to assess those things using your online training. And so that's where it helps to use a mixed method of training. That's probably the most effective way that I've seen is to make sure that you're using online training for concepts and things that can be assessed there, uh, but there's a lot of um, objective train or objective assessment that needs to be done uh, by somebody that is there that can look over somebody's shoulder or that can actually watch them performing the task. Um, Simulation is another great way if you can take advantage of that. Okay. It looks like uh, there are several uh, comments that have come in where people um, go through the online training, uh, the web-based training, and then they have them go and complete the task uh, in the store or in the work context itself, uh, and then they assess that. So it looks like that's most of the comments that I've seen here and suggestions. Mm -hmm. um. Okay, it uh, looks like most of the other comments and things are uh, just in relation to the presentation itself. Um, we'll put together some other answers. We'll take some of these offline and send those responses to you. Uh, we've got your contact information as part of the webinar, uh, but we'll also send you out a link of the recording to the webinar. So first I wanted to thank you for participating. Um, and then I'd love to invite you to come out to Rapid Intake's website and uh, you can go through and practice with one of the courses. Uh, use the authoring tool to start uh, your own um, storyboard uh, template to help facilitate the five-star um, uh, training system. 
So thank you again and hope you have a good day.